And good Monday afternoon. My name is Ryan Belmore, and I am the owner of What's Up Noob. And Mr. Frank Prozins joins us. Hey, Frank, how are you doing? Pretty good, Ryan. How are you? Good. And I feel like today we are just jumping from Zoom to Zoom and uh, jumping in all different people's homes. Yeah, it's good to jump. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have an important conversation uh, today. Tell us about uh, what we're going to chat about and uh, who you, about your guests. Well, everybody, well, I shouldn't say that. I think most people know Keith Stokes, who um, has uh, been involved in a lot of different things and certainly involved in a lot of um, heritage, store, uh, historic kinds of uh, discussions. And, and uh, he is one of the uh, prime movers behind a, an effort to create a black history and heritage curriculum in our school system from kindergarten through high school, um, something that Governor McKee uh, signed into law a little over a week ago. We're going to talk with Keith uh, uh, about that, what it, what it means, um, and why it's important. Keith is president of Strategic Planning and Development for the May 4th Group. He's also vice president of the 1696 Heritage Group, which really is uh, the backbone of, uh, of this project, uh, and of which I believe, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, I think Nellie Gorbea, uh, Secretary of State, is either the chair or plays a, a prominent role in it, but um, pretty exciting stuff, I think. Well, I'm going to move out of the way and let uh, Mr. Stokes take my spot here and uh, let you guys have a great conversation. How are you doing, Keith? Hey, good afternoon, Frank. Great to see yeah. you again. So I see the grandfather clock in the background. So if uh, I forgot to turn mine off in the background, if it goes off, I'm blaming it on you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'll be mine. It's, it's We just had to have it retuned. So uh, we're ver very proud that it's still operating. Ah, well, this one is too. So um, sometimes a little bit too loudly. Um, so, it, first of all, this is um, this is, I think, long overdue. Uh, creating a curriculum on um, on uh, Black history and heritage in our in our school systems. How did this come about, and um, and when will this actually be implemented? Well, the uh, Rhode Island African Heritage and History Curriculum was signed into law uh, by Governor McKee last week at a ceremony in Providence. But what's most important is, is that this has been a ongoing collaboration of leading historical societies, colleges, and academics and scholars for almost six and a half years. Um, back in 2014, 2015, um, I had the honor to draft legislation that created what became the 1696 Heritage Commission. Uh, 1696 is an important year. It's the year of the first documented slave ship to arrive in Rhode Island at Newport from Barbados called the Seaflower. And Secretary of State Nelly Gorbea chaired that commission, which was comprised of educators, scholars, historians. And we spent the next several years beginning the process of collecting and documenting all of the primary records uh, that are associated with African heritage and history. Uh, one thing people don't recognize is being a very early American state, one of the first of the 13 colonies, we have about four centuries and thousands upon thousands of documents to sort through, more so than many other states in the country. So over that period of time, we were looking at curriculum options. Uh, we were looking at taking sources of information, again, documents, artifacts, heirlooms, and putting it together in a level of a content that could be presented from K to 12 students and teachers. Uh, that was completed over a year ago. We went before the General Assembly and made a request that we now are ready to implement a full curriculum. It was, I can't tell you, the, it was embraced by unanimously in the House, led by Representative Anastasia Williams of Providence, and then the Senate, represented by Sienna Tierra Matt, and it sailed through the legislature, and it was signed immediately by the governor. I, I can't tell you how uh, appreciative we all are uh, of the support of our legislative and business leaders. Uh, the legislation itself is set up to not begin until the 2022-2023 academic year. That gives us, again, an additional year to continue collecting, sorting, documenting, and aligning what this curriculum would be. And I just want to emphasize that uh, having a K-12 to curriculum would make it one of the most comprehensive in the country. The fact that we use the term African heritage in history is very important. This is not Black history. It's not African American history. It's the history of the African diaspora. So this curriculum, the stories, the historical content will incorporate everyone and anyone that's a part of the diaspora, meaning people from the West Indies, South and Central America, certainly West Africa, and then certainly here in Rhode Island and across America. So we're very proud of this effort, but it's going to take time and deliberate effort. And most importantly, it'll be led by scholars and academic institutions. 
So um, as I understand it, the curriculum is actually still in development, um, at least probably until the several months anyway, <clears throat> until it actually is ready to be implemented. There are many aspects of it that's been completed. There's certain, again, we're, we're talking, Frank, about four centuries of work. And when we talk about African heritage in history, we're talking about events during the founding period of the 17th and 18th century, which would include slavery and slave trade. We're also talking about events in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, even to the very present day. So to be accurate, to be comprehensive, we need to take our time to design and build in all aspects of this important history. And who is actually working on this curriculum now um, as, it, as it, I guess, moves towards its finalization? Uh, the partners have been led by the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society. They are one of the earliest and oldest Black Heritage Societies in the nation. Uh, the society itself has over 2,600 cubic feet of collections dating back to the colonial era to sort through. Rhode Island Historical Society, our leading state historical society, Newport Historical Society, Providence Preservation is working with us. And then most importantly, on the academic side, it's being led by Rhode Island College, who also through their Department of Education is a leader in teacher professional development in education certification. So we've had this team in place for many years. They're working deliberately we now, and now we have a law in place to allow us to build this curriculum and launch it, again, no later than the 2022-2023 academic year. Is your expectation that when this curriculum is finished and it actually gets implemented into the classroom, that there's um, room for flexibility and change as it moves forward, I would suspect so. Absolutely. I mean, this, this curriculum, uh, we hope, is unique because it's driven by the rigor of academic and historical institutions. So the content is quite comprehensive. Um, it'll allow any educator or school or student to have access to a vast trove of information. Again, I want to point out that we're talking about not one point in history. We're talking about four centuries of history. In fact, I would suggest that one of the mistakes that have been making, possibly well-intentioned, is the impression that African heritage and history is slavery. Uh, in fact, slavery is not African heritage history. African heritage history is how African heritage men, women, and children survived and thrived despite enslavement. And then they have a whole life before slavery, and then certainly during and after. One of the aspects that we're very excited about in this curriculum is a unit of instruction that would be entitled Africa before European colonization so that students and teachers and others would have access to and information about Africa, the continent, and then the African countries and their existence thousands of years before European colonization and the slave trade. So people get to have an introduction to the African people, their culture, their religion, their labor, and workforces and all the things that they would bring into the new world and particularly to a place called Rhode Island. So when we talk about a curriculum that goes from kindergarten through high school, obviously this is a curriculum where, where every year the students are going to be exposed to some kind of education relative to the African heritage and history. It, it would, Frank. And again, um, I'm the greatest fan of public education, and I have a absolute confidence in public educators and teachers. And I've had the opportunity to work with and talk with educators around the state about this over the last several years, particularly those involved in history, civics, and social studies. So the goal would be is the curriculum would be a menu. You would have opportunities where, let's say you have a middle school social studies teacher, and she is particularly looking to talk about the American Civil War and Rhode Island's participation in the Civil War and African heritage participation in the Civil War, then she can pull out elements of that curriculum to build that into her teaching of the Civil War. You might have another teacher focusing on the American Revolutionary era and wanting to talk about the American Revolution or maybe the state's early founding under the tenets of religious freedom and toleration, but pull in aspects of African or African-American history tied to that. So the goal is, is to empower our great educators and give them access to resources and tools to do what they do very well, which is to teach our young people. So I assume that there's going to be a component about uh, teacher training and also being able, how do you disseminate that information um, to all of the public school teachers within Rhode Island? Uh, that's very important. And in fact, we're lucky to have Rhode Island College and also Rhode Island Historical Society. Both have been deeply involved in designing, developing, and launching various aspects of historical and teacher content training. We're also having discussions about developing an annual conference uh, in Rhode Island. 
that provide opportunities to access to new information, uncovered information, and new teaching techniques. Uh, in fact, this past winter for Black Heritage Month in February, our collaboration received through the Black Heritage Society a major grant from the Walmart Foundation to go directly towards building the curriculum and designing a teacher uh, training and professional development program. So we've been very fortunate not only to have the legislation in place and the partnership, but we've had private contributors step forward to support this effort. In fact, hopefully by this fall, through the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, we'll be launching a learning web portal that will allow and engage students and teachers to go online and to begin to have access to the historical content as we've been digitizing and posting and setting up in files all this information. Is this, um, is this unique to Rhode Island or are other states doing something similar or maybe to a greater degree or to a lesser degree? Well, there are many states and some larger cities that have been building different aspects of history and, and, and education, and particularly around what they call Black history or African-American history. Um, ours is more comprehensive because it's African heritage. It takes on the entire diaspora over four centuries. Um, ours is important because of the professional teacher development component, which I think is absolutely instrumental in launching and sustaining a program. And I think what's most important from Rhode Island's perspective is, is that it's really been led by scholars and academic institutions um, who are really best suited to manage these programs and interpret this history. And, and again, I think it's absolutely essential that what we present has been properly vetted, documented. When the curriculum design is in its final stages, it will still have to be reviewed and vetted and promulgated ultimately by the Rhode Island Department of Education, as it should be. This um, curriculum is only in the public schools. There's no requirement on the private schools, on parochial schools. And I'm not sure how we view charter schools. Are charter schools considered public schools or, or private schools? When a group of us uh, initially designed this legislation and developed this program, the focus was on K-12 to public schools and public education, uh, and particularly focus on public schools who may not have the resources that charter and certainly parochial private schools might have. And this was an opportunity to provide and present a history, an important history, to all students, and particularly students who may not have those resources. Also, plainly speaking, a significant percentage of the students in public schools represent African heritage and other racial ethnic groups. So if we really wanted to connect with students who had a real historical connection to this and a real need for this history, it just made sense that K to 12 public schools would be the starting point. Does that mean that private schools, public schools could not participate? Absolutely not. Rhode Island Black Heritage Society and all of our partners are very willing to work with those private schools that have this interest. And in fact, many of them have reached out for tours, exhibits, and programming. And in many cases, Frank, they just have more resources to do those things as compared to a public school, particularly in some of our urban communities. Um, how, how do we classify charter schools? Are they considered public schools or, or private schools or somewhere in between? That's above my pay grade. I believe <laughs> under the uh, Rhode Island Act, they are public, but again, uh, our goal was to focus initially as a starting point on traditional public K-12 schools. Will every school have access to this information? Absolutely. In fact, I'm most proud of the fact that being a Newporter, uh, a significant percentage of this history will entail Newport, you know, which is a very important contributing community of the 39 cities and towns of Rhode Island. So I'm very proud that Newport uh, will have significant presence, as many other communities will also. So I understand the importance of this, and, and particularly I understand it to the non-African community, non-African heritage community, if you will, the importance for other people to, we, we don't get anywhere unless we understand each other um, on every level. And so uh, for that for that um, white kid who's brought up in an affluent area of, uh, of Lincoln, to be able to go through and understand uh, the, the African heritage in, in, uh, in Rhode Island, I think is extremely important as they face a world that in fact, they're gonna have to be able to deal with people uh, and, and, and work as colleagues and, uh, and so forth uh, throughout their lifetime. So I find that in, in incredibly important. How do we reach, and this goes beyond this curriculum, how do we re reach those who are no longer in school and no longer have access 
to this material? Well, it's a great question. Um, I think the first part of the question is, is that, you know, a more inclusive history does not change how history is taught. It just augments and enriches what all students will learn. And African heritage history is for all students and it represents all students. In fact, uh, you could be multiracial, biracial, have an African heritage. You could be white and have an African heritage with now DNA results. Certainly our Latino community in Rhode Island have deep African roots from Dominicans to Cubans to Puerto Ricans. Uh, certainly we have a large number. In fact, there are possibly more African born people in Rhode Island than African Americans. So they certainly have a connection in this history, indigenous people, Cape Verdeans. So we see this and we're designing and developing this to be a comprehensive history an inclusive history that everyone can participate in. And again, how we present this history will be based upon documented uh, historical recovery of interpretation of documents in the actual stories. So if we're talking about, as an example, the slave trade in the 18th century in Newport, we also have to remind people of the white leadership that fought against slavery. And there were leaders. In fact, one of the earliest abolitionists in America is Moses Brown of Providence and Reverend Samuel Hopkins in Newport. Very few people even know that fact, but we have records and primary documents to begin to tell those stories. As far as anyone who is past high school and in the general community, again, the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society in developing this web learning portal is developing that as a resource to the larger community. There's a focus for students and teachers, but it's not to say that general public wouldn't have access to it. We have another private contributor with the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society that's providing funds to provide busing and transportation access to physical history tours around the state, starting in Newport. And again, we've seen that's a barrier for many public schools with limited resources. Having access to transportation and busing has been an impediment to field trips. And now we have a private sector person stepping in and saying they're willing to underwrite that cost, remove that barrier, and give kids in Rhode Island an opportunity to firsthand see, feel, touch, and experience an historic site. Uh, I, I just want to, again, emphasize, Frank, What's most exciting here is Rhode Island is not California or New York or Texas. We're small, we're compact, and you can get across the state and learn as much of our history in a scaled, deliberate, and comprehensive approach as compared to anywhere else in the nation. And I think that's a feather in the cap for all of us as Rhode Islanders. I mean, that's a plus with so many things in Rhode Island where we're almost an incubator for a lot of things. And we have the ability to do things on a statewide basis that uh, virtually no other state perhaps with the exception of Delaware, um, has, uh, are, are able to do. Um, teachers will come, will this be taught through a social studies component, a history component, or will this cross over a lot of disciplines? It really should cross across disciplines, and that's up to the educator in the school system. Again, uh, African heritage history can be incorporated in an arts program, a science program, a civics program, because there's so many other aspects of that. Well, uh, business and years finance. Ago, Rhode Island Black Heritage Society created an exhibit, um, and it's an exhibit of some of the earliest African heritage medical professionals, men and women who were doctors and physicians and leaders all during the 19th, early 20th century. And this was an exhibit sponsored by Neighborhood Health Plan. So again, that exhibit might have significant relevance in a science coursework, particularly in the areas of biology. So we're very excited of the fact that we think the greatest benefit here is the richness and deep content that will be available to teachers and students in schools. And then they can draw from that content and begin to design and develop curriculum that fits their program of studies or their interests and their needs as a student, as a teacher, and most importantly, as a school system. As you refine this curriculum, um, how can the general public uh, be able to provide any input? I, I know that there are many people who, uh, you know, as you, you look at what your older relatives have have uh, have saved or whatever, will come across these nuggets that can can add significantly to some of our knowledge. How can people access that, or how can people play a role in that? Well, the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society is the lead team leader in this. If anyone has questions or if they have content that they would like to offer, they should contact the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society. And again, they're working with a team of scholars and academics and historians who are pulling everything together, sorting through it, organizing it, and then putting it into documented, validated content. As you can tell, by the way, um, 
Keith, my uh, my grandfather clock is a little off <laughs> in timing. <laughs> so, but that's okay. They almost, if they're old, they always are, and you're always fine tuning and timing it and resetting it. Uh, but it's a uh, but it's a nice piece to have. Um, the so this starts. Well, give me an idea. Just I'm, I'm trying to put my head around a little bit. What happens on a kindergarten level with this versus what happens later on? Obviously, it gets more sophisticated as we go along. What, as an example, what what are you thinking about in those early grades? Well, well, again, that's up to educators to make those decisions. I mean, we will be bringing the content together, designing the content, working with educators, and they will be best equipped to provide what is most appropriate and what is most important for early learners. So an elementary school learning program would be different than a middle school, which again would be different than a high school. And even within high school, AP history might be different than general history. So that really should be designed and built by the educators. And I have a significant amount of confidence in our public educators and, and everything that I've heard from superintendents to school committee members to teachers has been very positive. And, and we see this as a design build process. I mean, one curriculum doesn't fit all. That's absolutely not the way to design and develop a program such as this. It needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to be designed and built within the ease of the teacher, within his or her classroom, and the expectations of her students or his students. But again, you know, Frank, what makes this special is, is that we're talking about four centuries and reams of information to catalog. There will not be enough information for people to draw upon. I would actually challenge that in many cases, when we tend to focus on such as Black History Month, one month of the year, we tend to focus more on outside of Rhode Island or the standard historical interpretations of Martin Luther King, Harriet Tubman. It's not to say those individuals are not important. They're extraordinary individuals, but there are men, women, and families and stories right here in Rhode Island that predate Martin Luther King and even Harriet Tubman in the areas of civil rights and social justice and education reform and human freedom. So we have all the content in the world. It's a matter of sorting it, validating it, and then really engaging our educators and school systems so they know what is the best way and the most efficient way to deploy for student learning. We hear a lot, particularly in the towns of Westerly and in, uh, uh, in South Kingstown, on the Charaho school system, there are noises out there of people who are, uh, who are claiming that in their uh, in their public schools, they're teaching critical race theory, which is not true. Um, and uh, it probably is a, um, uh, uh, is, they use critical race theory in a way that's really not about critical race theory. Um, how do you differentiate and, um, uh, and, and how does this differ? Well, uh, critical race theory is exactly that. It's a theory. It's something that's existed for a very long time, uh, really as a part of college level and really legal interpretations of the issues of race and discrimination in United States law. Um, I have never in my experience seen critical race theory as a high school or an elementary school or a secondary school program. I think the challenge right now is, is that I think many people, because of the angst of the unknown, are interpreting critical race theory as something that's actively engaged within schools. Uh, it's a part of a school process or a curriculum process. Uh, and quite candidly, I've not seen that. And what's most important is, is the work that we've been doing well before critical race theory was even in the public discussion. We've been very focused on assembling historical content and data, vetting it, validating it, and most importantly, interpreting it in the proper context. I think we can all agree, Frank, that history can be challenging and history can be difficult. And we have an absolute obligation to present history as it unfolded, good, bad, or indifferent, warts of all. But it's how it's interpreted and how it's presented and the proper context that is presented that ensures that every student is fully engaged, is learning, and not feeling uncomfortable. What I'm hearing with some of the CRT debate is not the issue of lesson plans, but more, is my student or child uncomfortable? And I don't think any one of us want to be in a circumstance where anyone is feeling uncomfortable in a learning environment. Because to be plainly speaking, if you're uncomfortable, you shut down, you turn off, and you're not learning. So we're very excited for the work that we've done. Everyone in every institution, regardless of race or color or district or location, has come back and told us that this is valuable 
and we want more and we're engaged in doing more and working with you. Uh, tell there's, me a little bit. my grandfather clock, so it's <laughs> four o'clock, a little bit, a little bit early. All right. Well, we're, we're uh, yeah, we've got just a few minutes left, not many, but I want to, uh, I wanted to go back to the website a little bit and uh, talk about timing with the website and what it would contain. And I, I assume this is interactive a little bit. Yes. Again, the, the goal is the fall and the team is working on it now. We, again, we've got a lot of content to put in and the goal would be is to create a learning web portal sponsored by the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society where students and teachers and then the general public could have access and again, it'll be set up based upon digitized images of historic artifacts, people and photographs, events and places. So as an example, it might look like a digital map of Rhode Island connected to a digital map of the African diaspora. And you could click on East Greenwich, Rhode Island, and you can learn the history of what was called Scallop Town. Scallop Town was a early African heritage enclave in the late 19th, early 20th century. And you can see images and learn histories of something that generally people may not recognize or know. Or you can click on an individual. The Reverend Malon Van Horn is the state's first elected African heritage legislature in 1885 as a Republican. And you can learn about his story, read some of the bills and legislation he submitted, and some of the stories that are associated with this man and many others. So it will be interactive. It will have videos, we'll have images, but most importantly, we see it as a starting point to begin to engage teachers and students and get them excited on what a full-fledged curriculum will look like in the ensuing year. Um, and I, and I, I presume that will become available to people and even teachers beginning in, in the fall so that they, act, they can actually get a leg up on some of this stuff as they move forward. Yeah, it's a design build process. You know, clearly the goal is, is that it would be a free access for teachers and educators. Um, if private individuals, companies, there might be a fee, all that has to be is in discussion phases. I mean, the absolute focus is in designing and building and launching it. And then most importantly, making it a resource to educators and students and families. And, and as I've said before, you know, in 2021, we live in a technology age where information technology is driving history. And one of the challenges is, is that the average person will go on the Internet and think Wikipedia is a way of sourcing factual, accurate history. When, in fact, Wikipedia is just groups of people providing their interpretation of the content. So it is very important to us that this process is driven by, validated by historians and academic leadership. In the state of Rhode Island, um, I would be uh, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention that another great resource for people is the Secretary of State's website um, that has all kinds of information about uh, uh, about a variety of things. If you go on the civics education area, um, that's uh, that's uh, particularly relevant. Keith, is there anything that we we missed or anything you would like to add? No, again, it's a starting point, and there's a lot of work to do. And it's a, a process that's going to require lots of hands and lots of participation. And if people have questions, please reach out to the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society. And again, they're leading this team effort. Uh, it'll be a design build process. And we're looking forward to working with people. But most importantly, we're looking forward to doing something very special in a long time coming, you know, providing an inclusive history that recognizes the history of all Rhode Islanders. Keith, I just wanted to take a moment uh, while I had you. Um, you just want to mention the festivities coming up at Toro next week. Uh, great opportunity to mention it if we have a second. Oh, ab absolutely. As as uh, vice chair of Toro Synagogue Foundation Education Committee, um, August 15th at 1 p.m. Sunday, we're having our George Washington uh, letter reading ceremony uh, partially live. Um, it's been a challenge this past year, but we're very excited to have some aspects of this available to the public. Another venue that'll be available if you haven't had the chance, particularly if you're a Rhode Islander, the Hebrew Cemetery on the corner of K and Bellevue Avenue will be open to the public. Uh, that cemetery dates back to 1677. It is one of the oldest existing Hebrew cemeteries and general cemeteries in America. And we staff on hand to provide you content information about who's buried there in the background. And again, you know, this is Newport. What a wonderful place to live, work, worship in a place like Newport, because our history uh, is unprecedented as probably some of the deepest and richest history in all of America. Keith, I just wanted to clarify something. You said that the uh, the reading of the letter is going to be partially live. You don't mean that George Washington is going to be partially live there, do you? 
Uh, no, no, but uh, his spirit will be there. And more importantly, the spirit of the founding members of the congregation that kind of pushed George Washington in responding uh, in his famous letter. So the spirit of George Washington, Moses Satius, and so many will be with us on Sunday. And again, our goal is to come back public again, bring the people together again, and hopefully, uh, God willing, uh, in health, we'll be able to continue to build these programs and have more public exhibits and public gatherings. And we have uh, more information about uh, those events up on whatsappnuke.com. Now, Tor Synagogue just sent them over to me just before Keith joined us. So uh, we appreciate that. So you can find out more and uh, participate virtually or uh, go out there. So excellent. Thank you, Keith. Okay, thank so, you. Thank you, Ryan and Frank. And again, we look forward to coming back on and you know sharing more of this information. It's it's all very well, exciting. Yeah, we're excited to keep reporting on it. This is a, I think it's a great achievement and you certainly should be very proud of your effort and everybody coming together to make this work. Well, it only took us 400 years to get to this place. So uh, we've had some time behind us now. We're, we're looking forward to get to work. Can't wait to talk to you in another 400 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Take care. All right. And uh, Mr. Prozitz, I need to get in on the grandfather clock uh, group here. Yeah, you got to get one. Hey, it's, uh, you it's all right. You grandfather first. Nah, you can, you can, you can be a toddler and have one. <laughs> all right. All right, Mr. Prozitz, that was a great conversation. Yeah, it was good. Uh, Keith is always terrific. And this is a, this is a great step forward. It's, I think, pretty exciting. Just a, my real quick commentary is the more, the more that we understand one another, uh, the better off we are in living together. That's it. And if anybody missed this conversation, if you want to share it, if you only caught a portion, it's available on whatsupnoop.com now. Um, you can also find it on our YouTube. You can find it on our Facebook page. Please share it um, with some folks and uh, let them know uh, what's happening in our school system. Uh, you know, we're among the first in the country. Um, we should celebrate that and we should learn more about this and we should see how we can support this. Absolutely. All right, Mr. Prozitz, until next time, my friend. Thank you. All right. On behalf of Frank Prozitz, myself, and all of us here at What's Up Newt, I want to thank Mr. Keith Stokes for joining us again. Available on whatsupnoop.com if you missed any. Thanks for watching.